Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, venturing out on a lovely, sunny Wednesday evening. Uh, welcome to the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. Uh, my name is Archie Kaiser. I teach here mainly, uh, but also in the Department of Psychiatry Residency Training Program. You know, when I was thinking about what I was going to present as my mini law lecture tonight, I had lots of challenging issues I could have chosen from. In my own fields, which are criminal law and procedure and mental disability law, um, there are always difficult um, and interesting issues. Um, so it was very hard to decide what I would choose for this you know, semi-captive audience, let's say. Um, I chose my topic tonight, uh, demystifying the mental disorder defense, um, because there has been much public discussion of late about the intersection of mental disorder and crime. And I regret to say that uh, that discourse is often based upon myth and prejudice and ignorance. So I thought, you know, perhaps it's time for me to you know, say a few things in public and also to help the public understand some of the issues that are in play. So I called my topic Demystifying the Mental Disorder Defense. That intimidated me somewhat. You know, it suggested A, you know, there's some mystery around it, and B, I'm going to remove it. I, I looked at uh, the, the Canadian Oxford Dictionary definition of demystify, so I used my words intentionally. I'm supposed to clarify, and especially obscure beliefs or subjects, etc. I'm supposed to simplify, I'm supposed to explain. The example they give is that this book attempts to demystify computers, end quotes. So, this lecture will attempt to demystify the mental disorder defense, but a whole range of issues that uh, uh, touch upon it. I've probably bitten off more than I can chew. Um, I probably have pitched it at a level which will be unsatisfactory to most, because when I look around this audience, I see people who are working in the field from the uh, mental health and legal perspectives. I see uh, uh, other persons you know, who bring to bear their community uh, experience. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not sure that I'll get anybody's level of knowledge right. And I may alienate everyone from the point of view of their level of interest. But all these caveats aside, I decided to you know, press on regardless. So we'll start off with what I'm going to do tonight. Um, I'll, start, I'll start with the, you know, what I've called prefatory comments. It's really a chance for me to announce my you know, position on a number of you know, uh, issues where you know, there is considerable public discussion. I will be talking about what I've called key elements of the criminalization of persons with mental health problems and remedial uh, responses. Uh, because if I only talked about the mental disorder defense, I think you'd be singularly misled about the intersection of mental disorder and the criminal law in Canada. And I will look at what I've called here threats to human rights that may reinvigorate criminalization. And then, because as I say, I, I never hesitate to overreach myself, I've decided, well, why don't I provide a short history of the mental disorder defense? <laughs> Why don't I, because you've never looked at it before perhaps, why don't I look at fitness to stand trial um, as well? Because sometimes people kind of uh, collide the two, um, the fitness issue, and they're not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder defense. So, I, you know, rather unwisely, I've decided to try to tackle both. And I'm going to finish with you know, what I've called another threat on the horizon, Bill C-54. You know, that's uh, you know, an act which is intended to reform um, aspects of uh, Part 20.1, the mental disorder amendments uh, in the criminal code. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's what I'm going to try to do. So you can follow me, you can follow the, you know, the script, uh, or none of the above, I suppose. Um, but I do want to start off with making some prefatory comments. And I couldn't uh, help myself but keep in the foreground for me, and I hope for you, that this is a community uh, that, like many, and I'm not saying just Nova Scotia, I'm saying you know, Canada, um, is infected with mental disability prejudices that stigmatize people with mental health problems and those with intellectual difficulties. And there are widespread and uninformed beliefs that people with mental health problems are unpredictable and dangerous. So in fact, 
This part of the community, I want to say up front, is not more violent than other members of the community. If anything, people with mental health problems are more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. The Supreme Court of Canada, you know, which hasn't always been attuned to these issues, did you know, say in the Winko case, a major authority, as you'll see later on the mental disorder amendments, contrary to the stereotypical notions that some still may harbor, persons who are mentally ill are not inherently dangerous but they have been long subject to negative stereotyping and social prejudice. Very few people, to preface my remarks as well, charged with criminal offenses ever claim the mental disorder defense. That's why it would have been inadequate to only talk about the NCR defense and the, and the unfitness issues. Recent research uh, out of Ontario showed that one one thousandth of a percent of accused in Ontario, given the overall number of charges, use this defense. And of the people who do uh, use the defense uh, on the, the not criminally responsible and kind of mental disorder defense, only a small portion, 10% uh, approximately, involve severe violent offenses. But with respect to this population, we have to keep in mind that their rates of recidivism are much lower than other offenders. Um, and many other people in the NCR context are what I've called here forensified. That is, their index offenses are far less serious. And, you know, at times one is not sure, although technically they qualify whether they should be going through the forensic justice system. But everyone, you know, who is subject to the NCR defense is monitored far more intensively for a much longer period of time than other offenders. Those are the facts. The criminal justice system in Canada, and I'm going to address this fairly extensively, has seen an overrepresentation of persons with mental health difficulties. That's the real ground level truth. People are being criminalized who don't belong as subjects of the criminal law. And finally, in terms of my prefatory comments, because they're animated in part by the government's introduction of Bill C-54, as you'll see later, Canada has had a well-functioning and fairer system, and I'll put it in some historical perspective later, for considering what should be done with unfit and NCR accused since 1992. And I believe that the current law and procedure governing the decisions of criminal review boards is facing an extraordinary and unjustifiable attack under Bill C-54, currently before Parliament, the Not Criminally Responsible uh, Reform Act. So in case you have any doubts about where I stand, that's my, you know, in part the line in the sand, or the lines in the sand. So I do want to then, you know, close these prefatory comments with this kind of coverage from the Daily News. It says, get the violent crazies off our streets. That's what you sometimes see. This is an old headline, but that's what you sometimes still see infecting our news media. And so I hope that all of you will, as the slide says, think outside the stigma. Think, truly think, um, and you'll be a cut above our current federal government, a cut above Mayor Rob Ford of the City of Toronto, um, and a number of other people who have spoken, in my view, uh, on an uninformed basis about the problems of the intersection of mental disorder and the criminal justice system. So, I'm going to turn and look briefly, because I could do the whole lecture on this, but briefly, uh, perhaps too fast, at what I've called key elements of the criminalization of persons with mental health problems. Because what I want you to think about is before we get to the formalities of the doctrine of uh, the mental disorder defense and the unfitness procedures, we need to think about how people in our community who have significant mental health difficulties encounter the criminal justice system and how they're treated within it. So, when I refer to criminalization, broadly speaking, I'm talking about using the course of uh, powers of the criminal law, but here for a portion of the population that from you know, these sources we'll see, uh, one can say that a criminal or legal response has overtaken a medical or social services response to behavior that's related to mental illness, as from CMHABC or the sentencing project from the US, it implies that people are being inappropriately processed through the criminal justice system rather than through the mental health system or with the benefit of community supports. As in this article from Luragio, you know, there are people who fall outside the country's social safety net, which is itself shrinking, and simply landing in the criminal justice system at an alarming rate. The Canadian Psychiatric Association in their December 5th, 2011 uh, position paper on the criminalization said that uh, they traced the trend of deinstitutionalization, transinstitutionalization, and the consequent criminalization of people with mental illness 
uh, and they found that there's an increase of people with mental illness within the criminal justice system, which appeared to correspond with the reduction in psychiatric beds. Not to say it's linear, and that's not to say that when people were in psychiatric beds that that was an inherently better environment, but on the other hand, that's what has occurred. The CPA says no one has taken responsibility for the care of one of the most disadvantaged and marginalized populations, and many people suffering from serious mental illness end up incarcerated owing in part to a lack of appropriate services to treat them in the community. The Canadian Bar Association in 2011 I might add, before the Canadian Psychiatric Association, a few months, not that we're competitive or anything, uh, made uh, uh, you know, their position known, and they made it known to the Minister of Justice and asked for his comment, you know, the current minister, Rob Nicholson, which was, I'm, I regret to say, at the CBA national meeting quite unsatisfactory. But the CBA's resolution said, there are significant numbers of mentally ill people who have become involved with the criminal justice system as opposed to the health care system, and the CBA urged government to allocate sufficient resources to reduce the criminalization of mentally ill individuals and to develop policies that enhance the lives of those uh, suffering from mental illness to prevent them from coming into contact with the criminal justice system. So these pictures really tell the story. You know, this is the image of the you know, asylum, as it was once called, from the 1800s, mid-1800s on. Um, and this is what's happened to it. It's literally been dismantled in the past 40 years. Um, and this is what has occurred with many people who were formerly residents of these large, essentially villages for people with disabilities and mental health problems. Uh, because of the lack of investment in appropriate community supports on a very wide basis. And this is the phenomenon that I was talking about and I will be talking about for the next few minutes with respect to criminalization. So these images, I think, do speak eloquently, although tragically, for themselves. So when I talk about criminalization, then I'm talking about what many people see as an inappropriate use of the criminal justice process for persons with mental illness. When we invoke and use the justice system, it's often unnecessary, it's often counterproductive for society, and it's usually damaging to the individual accused. And my approach, and that of many others, uh, is, and I include this Canadian Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Bar, and other advocacy organizations, is that wherever possible, we should prevent justice system involvements. Uh, and where there is a justice system involvement that has not been prevented, uh, then we have to minimize the harm that people experience in their interactions with the justice system when they have mental health difficulties. If we think of precursor factors, basically here it's pretty simple. You know, the person's mental health problem is directly related to his or her involvement with the justice system, and that problem, that mental health difficulty, causes, one way or the other, the interaction with the justice system, and the person's difficulties are exacerbated by the contact with the justice system. Mental health problems usually don't get better, unfortunately, you know, when the person comes into conflict with the justice system. So where the person's problems have not been previously remedied or ameliorated by mental health care and support, the justice system uh, is often called upon to provide the societal response to people uh, because we haven't done what we could have done to provide appropriate uh, support systems for people. As the Canadian Psychiatric Association says, Correctional facilities are becoming the de facto psychiatric institutions in the country. The justice system is quite dysfunctional at times, not always, but quite dysfunctional at times when it comes to its interaction of, with persons with mental illness. Any contact with the justice system is likely to cause harm to vulnerable people. Their symptoms may be exacerbated. Their social functioning may be diminished. Um, and overall, as we'll see more clearly as we go through this tonight, the purposes of the justice system don't fit well with the needs of persons who are mental health consumers. So recidivism may become more likely, and we see this phenomenon of overrepresentation emerging. You can look forward to improved service delivery. With appropriate services and supports, many mental health problems can be remediated, and crises uh, can be uh, averted. Crises that cause uh, conflict with the justice system can be uh, averted. But as anybody knows who works within these systems, there's been poor collaboration between the health and justice systems. Um, and obviously, we could achieve better outcomes if we work better together. Um, but on the other hand, if we accept that the justice system has badly served many persons with mental illness, uh, that doesn't imply vindication of the uh, current mental health care system. 
it too needs to be reformed, uh, although you know, the kinds of reforms may be different uh, uh, and uh, in some ways they may be less urgent in some areas. But the overall message about criminalization is that it's not inevitable. We don't have to bear this as a society. There are other ways of delivering services for persons with mental illness that will reduce the likelihood of their conflict with the justice system uh, and reduce the harm that they experience. The contemporary Canadian reality has no authoritative Canadian data on you know, the overall experience of persons with mental illness in the justice system. There's lots of relatively reliable evidence from responsible organizations that affirms what I've talked about, this overrepresentation. Uh, the Department of Justice in 2013 you know, provided this you know, um, just facts, as they call it, prevalence of mental illness in the justice system. They observed no national statistics, and it, it, the prevalence rate will vary. But they brought together things like police data, where you can see there in Vancouver and London uh, that there's an extensive and overuse of police services for persons with mental illness. In corrections, they noted from BC that more than half of offenders had a diagnosed mental illness. And in Quebec, that 61% had at least one diagnosis. In the federal system, and more of this soon, there's been a doubling of rates of inmates with mental health problems. And 36% of inmates, according to the Department of Justice, have uh, uh, difficulties that require follow-up. And uh, of persons, uh, of women in the justice system, they're more likely to have a mental illness, and some diagnoses are more prevalent. Justice points to depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And when you bring in uh, comorbidity, concurrent disorders, substance abuse, then the, you know, the, the uh, levels of uh, overrepresentation go up. The correctional investigator has been very active in Canada in bringing to uh, the attention of Parliament and, uh, and uh, the Canadian public the problems that uh, inmates uh, experience in the federal correctional system. You know, from uh, 2004 uh, on, um, you know, he has observed uh, that uh, the proportion of federal offenders uh, with identified mental health needs has more than doubled over the past decade, and successive reports uh, have uh, uh, specified, you know, the positive things that the federal government has done, but also the many shortfalls with respect to the delivery of services to federal inmates. And in the most recent report, the correctional investigator says basically it hasn't changed. Despite some good faith efforts, it's not good enough. So in federal corrections then, he points to a complex and compromised population where resource and capacity challenges facing Canada's correctional authority are significant and growing. Other sources will give you more or less the same uh, uh, kind of data. Um, the uh, uh, program uh, mental health division um, and court support services in Ontario says that they had a 27% increase since 1995. Alberta in 2001, steady increase in the utilization of law enforcement uh, uh, resources. The CMHA captured the basic themes here for many people who are criminalized with mental illness very well. Persons with mental illness are being jailed rather than helped due to a lack of community mental health services. The trigger for police involvement is usually a nuisance offense. There is an 81% chance they'll be apprehended again because they have not accessed adequate services and they're overrepresented in the jail system, which is unfunded and ill-equipped. That's the data such as it is. Um, there is therefore neglect and unsuitability in both systems. With respect to the civil mental health system, um, many, uh, including the, the Kirby uh, Senate report um, and the Romano report before that, have talked about the needs of persons with mental illness. They've referred to the mental health care system as being the orphan child or the poor second cousin. And then the justice system itself is unsuitable. And then, you know, as, we, as I've been trying to explain, there are very low utilization rates for the mental health provisions, mental disorder provisions of the criminal code, which we'll look at uh, later on. So when we look at the criminal law, it is mainly deterrent and it's punitive. Um, and uh, it's based upon a model of deliberation that does not suit you know, many people who have serious mental health difficulties if they come into conflict with the law. Model of deliberation, of knowledge, of understanding, and hence of moral culpability. Um, it is a blunt and cost costly instrument, and in many instances it's quite inappropriately invoked for persons with mental illness. There's insensitivity um, in uh, many doctrines, policies, actors, institutions within the justice system. And as the CPA says again, jails and prisons can be brutal places where people with mental illness who are often unstable and exhibit poor judgment are victimized and terrorized. So, 
how do you reduce criminalization? You improve supports and services uh, for people with mental health problems. And there are some you know, aspirations that we could think about now having been relatively well concretized both in Canada and internationally. You know, I think of the Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with uh, Disabilities. It's a whole other subject. Maybe you were here with, for one of our earlier mini-law lectures where we took on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, but uh, it's uh, the first human rights treaty of the 21st century, you know, where the uh, uh, credo is nothing about us without us. It had 155 signatories as of 2013 and 90 to the optional protocol, and it represents a paradigm shift. Under the convention, persons with disabilities, including people with mental health difficulties and intellectual disabilities, are not viewed as objects of charity, medical treatment, and social protection, but rather as subjects with rights who are capable of claiming those rights and making decisions, as well as being active members of society. So, actually, it's an indication of the lack of popularity, perhaps, of my last handout, but I happen to have quite a few handouts on my CRPD presentation. At the end of the evening, you know, you're welcome to pick up one of those if you want to learn more about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I can't cover it uh, more now. There are a number of parts you know, of uh, um, the uh, CRPD uh, that directly relate to the justice system, that provide for rights for individuals not to be interfered with in terms of their bodily and psychological integrity, but also positive social, educational, um, and uh, cultural and political rights, you know, broad, you know, positive rights uh, for people to be able to live in the community. Um, so that, you know, that is what I believe to be a key, um, a key resource for uh, developing our aspirations for how we as a community should relate to people with mental health problems. Why don't I just pass these out? You don't have to keep them, but at least I won't have the embarrassment of having them kind of recycled again. <laughs> but that's not what I'm talking about tonight. That's just important for you to understand that the world community has changed in its outlook on people with disabilities. Uh, and you know, one of the things I'm going to try to orient us all about tonight is to make sure we keep up with the rest of the world. The Mental Health Commission of Canada and its Mental Health Strategy for Canada you know, has dealt with the issues surrounding criminalization to some extent as part of Canada's National Mental Health Strategy in 2012. It too observes over-representation in how we ought to focus on preventing mental health problems and illnesses, providing timely access to services, treatments and supports in the community, to uh, wherever possible implement diversion programs as the next line of defense if you can't prevent crises, and in the justice system, ensure that people have a right to reasonable access to mental health services consistent with professionally accepted standards. Not a reduced norm you know, of uh, delivery of professional mental health services because they're in prison. I never quite understood why, and it, but it still persists that the Correctional Services of Canada has responsibility exclusively you know, for delivering mental health services to inmates. Rather than the system of healthcare delivery that all of us who are not currently federal inmates um, you know, have. Anyway, so the, the, even the Mental Health Commission of Canada, which is you know, at times pretty reticent about biting the hand that feeds it, you know, the uh, government of Canada, has said maybe there should be a transfer of responsibility to the civil system, away from Corrections Canada. Uh, we could look at the Criminal Justice and Mental Health Consensus Project as well. In many ways, this is the gold standard for many of the interrelationships described in the United States between criminal justice and mental health. I won't stop there now. So, um, what can we do to improve justice system uh, responses? Talk about improving the mental health care system, social support services. Um, you know, that's uh, not enough because some people are still going to be brought into conflict uh, with uh, the justice system. And we have to think about how to improve the justice system in addition. The major uh, concepts uh, that uh, you know, we would think about are the same as introduced by the Mental Health uh, Commission of Canada. Diversion, redirecting people with mental health problems away from the criminal justice system to community-based supports, and also ensuring that people who are involved in the justice system receive appropriate supports and services on a comprehensive basis. So there are things which we can do to reduce the phenomenon of criminalization you know, that uh, you know, we observe uh, in the nation's jails and penitentiaries. 
I regret to say, you know, there are many threats to human rights, as exemplified by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, that may reinvigorate in some ways, you know, the phenomenon of criminalization. I refer to reductions in social service budgets, reduced access to employment insurance, increasing social inequality, the contraction of addiction supports and services, the erosion of affordable housing, the failure to address the underinvestment in mental health promotion, illness prevention, and treatment services. All of these things are sadly going to result in more criminalization of people. A nation that permits vast social inequalities and that ignores people who are already on the margins um, is not a mentally healthy society. Uh, but besides that indictment, it's also a society where those same vulnerable people are going to come in conflict with the law. So, you know, maybe sometimes uh, cartoons illustrate what I can't as well. To me, it's the danger of increasing social inequality and neglect of marginalized people. So I'm not saying I agree with any of the following cartoons. They're much too far out on the left for me. I want to formally disassociate myself. It's just to give you an idea of what some people might think about how to think about our society. So here's one. I think you get the message. You know, here he's got euros, and everybody else is out here. Now, as I say, it's not my ideology, I can assure you. But, and here's another one. Stop robbing the poor to feast the rich. I think there's something wrong with that person, but you, know, you get the idea. As social inequality increases, then you know, the likelihood of criminalization also increases. That's a catchy little and simple design, isn't it? So those kinds of uh, developments in social policy will have, in my view, in the view of many others, the inevitable effect of increasing not only social inequality, but the likelihood of vulnerable people coming into conflict with the justice system. I regret to say uh, that uh, there are other issues more directly in my field, rather than the broad social policy and ideological uh, field, you know, that will have inevitable bad effects on the number of persons with mental illness who are criminalized. I refer to here more punitive approaches to criminal justice policy. And there's a whole range of things that the current government has done and is intending to do, apparently. I refer to, for example, the sentencing changes, the Truth in Sentencing Act, um, Bill C-25 from 2010, uh, that limited the, the credit that a judge may allow for time spent in pre-sentencing custody. Uh, commonly called credit for time served. That was introduced by Minister Nicholson as part of the overall assurance that the government has that they are tackling crime. For the category of persons that I'm talking about tonight, denying people or reducing the available credit for time served in custody prior to their eventual sentencing will cause some people with mental illness to serve longer periods of time in jail and will be, that'll be harmful to them. So the minister talks about tackling crime. I found this next slide, which I thought was quite charming. It, to me, turns the debate on its head. I didn't alter this. I did not Photoshop this, I swear. But it does, to me, put the debate in clearer perspective. The minister's head blocks out C-R-I and leaves in what I think we need to think about. That is, responding to these regressive criminal justice policies that are going to have the effect that I'm talking about, about increasing criminalization. There's the credit, by the way. The, which It's from the, you know, the Globe and Mail, after all. So there, I did not Photoshop it. I am not responsible. We could also look at the um, other changes that have been brought about by Bill C-10, the, for many people, infamous bill from 2012, the Safe Streets and Communities Act. 
you know, I think the current government gets people to come up with titles which are increasingly more absurdist in terms of what you know, they uh, actually accomplish compared to their labels. But this, this act you know, actually is intended to um, increase or impose minimum mandatory penalties for several criminal code uh, and uh, CD, Controlled Drugs and Substances Act offenses. It amends the Corrections and Conditional uh, uh, Release Act to, among other things, and I'll refer to this later, to eliminate the uh, least restrictive reference. And it doesn't commit the CCRA to uh, human rights protections. It amends the Criminal Records Act to remove pardons and make record suspensions more elusive. It amends the Youth Criminal Justice Act to emphasize public protection to increase the likelihood of pretrial detention for young offenders um, and uh, adult sentencing as well and longer custodial sentences. So, you know, there were a host of non-governmental organizations, of respectable professional organizations, not just people like me, academic lawyers and people who, you know, enjoy attacking government, um, good citizens, you know, who, uh, you know, band together as responsible professionals. Um, I'm only mentioning two here. The Canadian Psychiatric Association, not renowned for its radicalism, you know, they said this is from their representation to Parliament. Bill C-10 will dramatically increase the number of incarcerated individuals in Canada. Just like current populations, these people will experience mental illnesses at disproportionately higher rates. Without a robust mental health strategy, with its, with its aggressive stance on justice policy, the mental health crisis in our prisons will worsen. Canadian Psychological Association, similarly. I, I, there were, I, I, I looked at the Canadian Social Workers Association, the Canadian Prison Guards Association, the Canadian Bar Association, but I, I just mentioned this, this, these two tonight. The CPA, the Canadian Psychological Association, says uh, that C10 will put more people in jail for longer periods of time. Incarceration does not reduce crime. Uh, treatment works. We should instead be concentrating on moderate and high-risk offenders, targeting changeable risk factors, incorporating proven human services as part of offender rehabilitation. That was their submission to the Senate. <coughs> this poster for a rally you know, captures the Canadian Psychological Association, Canadian Psychiatric Association, and many other organizations outlook on Bill C-10. Time does not uh, stop crime. Um, and what would? Well, what would slow down crime at least, you know, is you know, a, a reversal of these sentencing policies. And what will slow down criminalization um, is uh, um, a uh, retreat, you know, from some of these harsh sentencing policies, which probably have their worst effects on the most vulnerable parts of the population. So, there is my opening salvo, you know, on criminalization. Um, uh, but you can see, I hope, why it became important to me to start off with this. I know that the title of my lecture is then somewhat misleading because you didn't come here to hear about criminalization. You came here to hear about the mental disorder defense. Um, but I wanted to start off this way because if we only talked about the mental disorder defense, you would, as I mentioned, get uh, a singularly misleading view of what happens with people with mental illness as they come into conflict with the justice system. So we start off with the criminalization piece. Keep it in mind, please. Now I'm going to turn to what you may have come for, the mental disorder defense and on fitness issues. So as I said, I, I'll start off with uh, a short history here. The early common law provided just no relief with, for persons, even with severely altered mental states. Eventually, it became obvious that there was something inherently morally wrong about convicting and punishing people you know, with radically altered uh, mental states as if they were regular offenders. So gradually, juries were empowered to return a special verdict of insanity, followed usually by a pardon. And insanity gradually became uh, recognized as a separate defense for those who were very floridly mentally ill. By the 1700s, though, you had to be seen as a brute or wild beast, absolutely lacking any reasoning capacity to benefit from the defense. You know, your, your mental health difficulties had to be on the true extreme end. By 1843, the McNaughton case in the UK, uh, which was followed by judicially imposed rules, permitted an acquittal by reason of insanity. And our criminal code, which we only developed in 1892, largely adopted the British McNaughton rules, which were liberalized in part over the years by our courts. 
um, until the Swain case in 1991, what we had in Canada, which was a not guilty by reason of insanity sanity verdict for an insane acquittee, meant that the trial judge had to order the person into strict custody immediately uh, with very few procedural protections. Ominously, up to the time of the Swain decision and then the mental disorder amendments, which I'll be talking about tonight, you were in custody at the pleasure of the lieutenant governor. That was the actual phrase in the criminal code which always struck me as having a very dangerous and perverse notion to it at the pleasure of the lieutenant governor because it suggested what the Supreme Court found. You know, that this complete allocation of, uh, uh, or complete abandonment of uh, structured uh, uh, rules to control the use of the discretionary power to detain was wrong. So Swain determined that this provision which, you know, for the insane acquittee to be detained at the uh, pleasure of the lieutenant governor was unconstitutional because it didn't provide due process, permitted arbitrary detention, absent any examination of uh, the accused condition and level of risk. So as a response to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada in the Swain case striking down the then uh, provisions which dealt with you know, persons who are found not guilty by reason of insanity. Part 20.1 of the Criminal Code was introduced, a whole section that dealt exclusively you know, with uh, mental disorder, at least in the context of unfitness um, and not criminally responsible determinations. It provided a much higher level of procedural uh, protection, new terminology, uh, and a new verdict, th what I've been talking about. You know, the, the not criminally responsible verdict, having committed the act, uh, but at the time suffering from mental disorder so as to be exempt from criminal responsibility. It left the substantive standard for the NCR defense, how you get to it, largely uh, for the courts to develop. It didn't interfere with what I'm about to explain, the so-called Section 16, the not guilty by reason of insanity defense, as it used to be called, the not criminally responsible defense. It also introduced new provisions for assessment orders, which I'll address briefly, um, and it clarified and modified the unfitness provisions overall. It created new provincially appointed review boards with a senior lawyer as chair and significant uh, mental health expertise being a necessary part of review boards. It established a procedure and standards for determining what is the appropriate disposition for a person who is found not criminally responsible or unfit. Um, and it required these review boards for the first time to, have to pay attention to statutory uh, declarations from the Parliament of Canada. The need to protect the public, uh, the mental condition of the accused, the reintegration of the accused, and the other needs of the accused. And then the review board, usually a review board, had to make a disposition that was the least onerous and least restrictive. And it would choose from discharging the accused absolutely, free then of state control, imposing appropriate conditions, or ordering that the accused be detained in custody subject to conditions. Subsequent uh, cases have uh, strengthened and clarified uh, uh, this uh, uh, legislation. Um, so that I'll mention as part of my brief historical tour some of them. The Winko case I've already mentioned, but it is the pivotal authority from the Supreme Court of Canada determining how we are to construe the mental disorder provisions of the criminal code. It emphasized individualized assessment, treating an accused with dignity, and according the person maximum liberty. It established uh, standards for when a person could get an absolute discharge, it confirmed, as I'll explain a bit more later, the constitutionality of Part 20.1, the Mental Disorder Amendments. Uh, and it did say, and it reminded us essentially, because I think this really is an ancient principle, that persons who are mentally disorder offenders should not, in fairness, be held morally responsible. They are spared the full weight of criminal responsibility. The NCR accused is not to be punished. You'll see how relevant that is when we look at the uh, uh, provisions of Bill C-54 shortly. The penitanguishing case of 2004, you know, kind of highlighted the importance of this least onerous, least uh, restrictive provision that, that uh, is the commanding uh, uh, note 
from the Parliament of Canada as to how you choose a disposition. It extended the least onerous requirement from the choice of dispositions in the community, or in a forensic hospital, or, or discharged absolutely, to the conditions that attach to dispositions. So everything that affects the accused at the review board is determined. The Mazai case in 2006 said, you know, that review boards can't prescribe treatment, but on the other hand, they do have power to make orders and attach conditions relative to the supervision of treatment. It didn't show sufficient muscularity as far as I was concerned, and I'd said so at the time, you know, to uh, uh, um, empower review boards to require services to be delivered to persons, you know, who were in forensic facilities. But at least it said, you know, we're not going to abandon them. That we're, we're going to permit review boards to have some structural role with respect to how people are treated. And then the Conway case in 2010, you know, uh, expanded the powers of criminal review boards and said, you know, and it took them a very long time to reach this, you know, position, which I always thought was singularly logical. It said review boards are courts of competent jurisdiction for the purposes of the lawyers in the room, section 24.1 of the charter. They can provide, review boards can provide charter remedies, which are previously only available in the courts. Now review boards could establish the, uh, constitutional remedies, you know, for accused persons who were before them. So the Conway case then strengthened the powers of review boards. Soon I'll be telling you how Bill C-54 is moving in the other direction, reducing the powers of review boards. So, that's a little tour of several hundred years of history of the mental disorder defense. Uh, now I'm going to immerse you um, in the two junctures uh, at which uh, mental disorder is most crucially relevant for the purposes of the mental disorder amendments of the criminal code. Uh, what I'm not touching upon here is mental disorder and the conventional sentencing uh, process. You know, that's beyond even my overly ambitious agenda tonight. So we're only going to deal with it at the level of, at the preliminary stages, is the accused fit to stand trial? Uh, or is he or she not because of you know, how profound the person's mental impairment is? And also we're going to look at it at, at the trial of the accused, who is fit to be tried? You know, was the accused at the time of the offense so seriously mentally disordered that he or she ought not to be held criminally responsible? We're going to look at both junctures. Now, you may well say, Fitness issues, I've heard about them before, if you're not a lawyer or not a clinician, but, you know, I thought that that kind of faded away. And if that's your intuitive sense, you're right in a way. But we're going to look at it because it's a crucial stage of the trial where the person who is before the courts still has a significant mental health difficulty compared to merely having it at the time of the offense and having stabilized. So we're going to look at a quick tour here of the fitness to stand trial provisions. I'll give you, you know, an introduction to the substantive and procedural law with respect to fitness determinations. Everybody's presumed fit to stand trial, right, if you're charged with an offense. That presumption has to be displaced. Either the Crown or the accused can raise the issue of fitness before the verdict, and a conclusion of unfitness requires proof on the balance of probabilities the civil standard. The legal standard for fitness is specified by Parliament in Section 2 of the Criminal Code. It, it means that a person who is unfit is unable on account of mental disorder to conduct an offense or to instruct counsel to do so, unable to understand the nature or object of the proceedings, under, unable to understand the possible consequences, unable to communicate with counsel. The Taylor case from the Ontario Court of Appeal articulated what still is the dominant authority in this area. It's called the Limited Cognitive Capacity Taste, Test. You know, where Barrett talks about it as the ability to relate the facts of the offense such that counsel could properly present a defense regardless of whether the accused instructions were deemed in good judgment or not. So it's not a guarantee that if you're fit to stand trial, you're making decisions which are in your own best interests. Quite the contrary. It just says you have enough orientation that you can provide kind of a minimalist type of instruction to your lawyer and you're at least uh, alert to some of the factual foundations. The Morrissey case from uh, 2007, the Ontario Court of Appeal said, what we require is meaningful presence, meaningful participation at the trial. These are the touchstones of the inquiry into fitness. Now, this standard has been criticized as being too low. It has been criticized because it is said to permit people with profoundly impaired judgments to be subject to the rigors of a criminal trial. So it remains controversial, but that is the law as we have it. 
If you're found unfit, you may be ordered to be treated for the purpose of making a, a person fit to stand trial. It's the only part of the criminal code where Parliament has said uh, to uh, uh, you know, judges that they can actually order a person to be treated. Otherwise, it's not possible. Most accused having been treated, and this may be why you know, this doesn't stay in your minds so that, that forcefully, uh, will eventually be found fit to stand trial. Very rarely where an accused is unlikely to ever become fit and doesn't pose a significant threat to safety. After the Damaris case from the Supreme Court of Canada and then a consequent amendment of the criminal code, there may be a permanent judicial stay of proceedings for that rare person who is going to be permanently unfit to stand trial. Here's a procedural flow diagram which will simplify this in part for you. By the way, I don't remember whether I said, and you may not have read at the beginning, that all my slides are going to be available online, Lindsay, sometime soon, uh, at, on the Dell Law website. If you'd like to look at these and possibly read them or possibly print them off, and the video of tonight will also be available if you want to replay some of our magic moments together. So this is what happens with respect to fitness issues. There's a presumption of fitness, as I mentioned. There is an assessment order which uh, can be issued by a judge if there are reasonable grounds to believe that evidence is necessary to determine the person is uh, fit. Usually, there's a written assessment report uh, which talks about you know, whether the person you know, has significant impairments. There's a trial of the fitness issue if there are reasonable grounds to believe the accused is unfit. If he or she is found to be unfit, any plea is set aside. Um, and uh, um, it, if uh, the person is found unfit, he or she may be ordered to be treated to make him or her fit. By the way, if the person is fit, then the proceeding continues as if the issue never arose, as you might expect. Um, the uh, court or review board has a hearing for the person who has been found unfit. And then they have the kinds of dispositions that I mentioned before that are shared with persons who are found not criminally responsible. And then the uh, review board, once it determines a person having made a disposition uh, to be fit, it sends the person back to court for a trial of the fitness issue, because only a court finally determines the fitness uh, issue. Um, and uh, um, the uh, uh, court determines whether that, that state has been reached. So, I hope that you know, this introduction to fitness and the flow chart will give you a sense of where the fitness issues go and how they are dealt with both substantively through the Taylor case in Section 2 of the Criminal Code and procedurally through this kind of flow that I've mentioned that's specified now by the Criminal Code. So that's the unfitness stream. As I mentioned, most people who were found unfit temporarily become fit and then they can go to their trial and they have the option to choose then uh, whether they'll defend on the basis of uh, their having um, a, a mental disorder defense. So now we're going to switch gears away from fitness. Now we're going to look at the person's mental state at the time of the commission of the offense. Um, so we're going to look at the basic nature of the current version of the insanity or not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder defense. This, uh, at its heart, uh, is an issue uh, that involves, as the Chalk case from the Supreme Court of Canada says, an underlying claim that the accused has no capacity for criminal intent because his or her mental condition has brought about a skewed frame of reference, a profoundly skewed frame of reference, not just the kind that you or I might have on a daily basis because we look at the world through different eyes and different ideological stances and different personalities, but a profoundly skewed uh, frame of reference. As the Bouchard-Lebrun case said in, in 2011, the NCR verdict protects the integrity of our country's criminal justice system and the collective interest in ensuring respect for its fundamental principles. In a way, that was a throwaway line for Bouchard-Lebrun. It, it's a toxic psychosis case. I won't get into it, although I'd love to because I wrote an article on it. And was, I was kind of angered by the case, but anyway, I'm over it for the time being. Um, Mr. Bouchard Lebrun took powerful drugs and he inflicted terrible harm on somebody um, and uh, he defended on the basis of uh, his being not criminally responsible owing to his 
psychotic state. The Supreme Court of Canada said no. He was just intoxicated, and uh, that's the end of it, and he's going to be convicted and punished like other people. So that's what happened in Bouchard Lebrun. But actually, this statement, I believe, is singularly important for us to appreciate at this juncture of our evening together. And when we think about Parliament's current stance on the mental disorder uh, uh, amendments, because what it underlines is that this verdict of NCR is not just you know a procedural nicety that's just left there, you know, and you know it's an artifact of times past. It protects the integrity of our justice system. It ensures that no one is convicted who has that profoundly skewed frame of reference. And it also ensures respect for our fundamental principles. We don't punish people in Canada who are so profoundly mentally disordered that they're not criminally responsible. So this is, in my view, a principle of fundamental justice. So when the Parliament of Canada starts amending it, as they are about to do, then I believe that you know, they are opening themselves eventually to the court saying, well, wait, you're going too far here. You're treading upon principles of fundamental justice. More of that later. So hence this image. You know, this is the essence, you know, or one of the essences, of criminal justice in a democratic society. The, you know, the, uh, uh, the scales of, of justice um, and also this principle that we're not going to punish people who are profoundly mentally ill, that being a fundamental principle. So what are the basics of you know, our current mental disorder defense in Canada? Um, Section 16.1 of the Criminal Code uh, specifies the requirements of the mental disorder defense. Assuming that the act is proved, you have to prove that the accused did the act in question, uh, then, whoops, then you know, what's required is proof of the person's mental disorder, um, proof which is sufficiently serious that it causes either the person to be incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of his or her act or of knowing that the act was wrong. All of these things have to be shown, as we'll shortly see on the balance of probabilities or the civil standard, before a person can be found not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. It is not, therefore, like some people would say who don't know very much, um, that is that it's just a walk and it's easy you know, for the accused. It is not in any sense and it's not advanced on a frivolous basis um, and uh, you know, it's not something uh, that uh, um, should be discussed in ways that trivialize. I'm looking here for a, a choice quote from Mayor Ford uh, from uh, um, Toronto. I'll come up with it because I did highlight it, um, you know, because he really didn't understand, you know, the law that well uh, when uh, he called into a local radio station um, before a jury was sequestered, uh, talking about the catch car trial uh, in Toronto recently, you know, where a person was found not criminally responsible of killing, you know, a, a police officer. You may have heard of the case, you know, driving a snowplow over the police officer. It's an awful incident. Uh, but, you know, the mayor of Toronto called into the radio station and said, um, be before the jury was sequestered, which, you know, if you're a po modern politician in Canada, normally you would never do because that shows disrespect for the judicial system and the deliberations of the jury. But that fundamental principle aside, Mayor Ford said, um, I'm really disappointed how the defense is presenting this, i.e. the defense of not criminally responsible. One of our finest got killed. He left behind a wife and little son and we're trying to find an excuse why he stole a snowplow and killed a police officer. I think you can't defend that. These people put their lives every uh, day in the line of fire. They jeopardize their lives and we are trying to justify this. He didn't get it. We're not trying to when we defend a person on the basis of not criminally responsible for even a terrible thing like this. We're not trying to justify the actions. This is not a justification or excuse, you know, as self-defense is. This is an exemption. You know, this says that the person's mental state is so skewed that, you know, they cannot be held criminally responsible. Um, the uh, uh, lawyer uh, 
uh, for uh, um, you know, one, of the, or one of the people on the panel said, the mayor seemed to be very misinformed about the legal principles that applied and the ramifications for Mr. Kachar if he was uh, uh, convicted. Um, it, they are in law held not criminally responsible, but it doesn't mean they get off. It doesn't mean that people are not held accountable. They're just held accountable in a different way. So the point is here, and I perhaps shouldn't be picking on poor Mayor Ford from Toronto. Uh, <laughs> the first applause of tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I picked... I've, I've, picked, I've picked an easy target maybe, but the point is you don't get the NCR verdict by just uh, you know, the uh, um, eminence of psychiatrists uh, or the persuasive ability of lawyers. The jury has to be persuaded on the balance of probabilities that all of these things are present. And then after that, you're not getting off. Okay? That's what was wrong and what the mayor said. So the burden of standard and proof, just as I said, everybody is presumed to be fit to stand trial. You're also presumed to be sane, not to suffer from a mental uh, disorder. If you raise the defense, you must prove it on the civil standard. Um, and uh, it, it's not sufficient to prove that you have a mental disorder. You must show that it, it was of sufficient severity as to satisfy either or both of the other limbs of the defense that I mentioned. And then you get this special verdict. It's not an acquittal. You're not getting off. It's not like self-defense, you know, where I get a complete acquittal and I'm not subject to state control. Quite the contrary. You're subject to a disposition which I'm about to explain. There are special procedures that obtain, you know, when you succeed in the NCR defense. Uh, a disposition hearing may be held by the court, usually by a review board, and the terms of the dispositions are, you know, as I mentioned before, with respect to Section 67254. With respect to the nature of the mental disorder defense, um, you know, there are these stages that I mentioned. The first stage, in some ways, the easiest hurdle for the NCR defense is to show that you have a mental disorder. You know, the Cooper standard from the Supreme Court of Canada said, this embraces any illness, disorder, or abnormal condition which impairs the human mind and its functioning, excluding most self-induced intoxicated states. Hence the Supreme Court of Canada's verdict in the Bouchard-Lebrun case, which I just mentioned. And it also excludes most transitory states that are caused by external factors such as hysteria or con concussion. That's a separate doctrinal stream in Canadian criminal law, you know, where you might be uh, able to be acquitted if... You know, if one of you hits me on the head now and then I assault one of you uh, acting in a concussed state, i.e. I'm not deliberating at all on any level, then I get, can get a complete acquittal. Um, so that's why we exclude transitory states. The nature of mental illness is that it's a long you know, uh, subsisting state. So w the Stone case and the Parks case say that we also inform our judgment as to what is a mental disorder beyond the Cooper case with a more holistic approach informed by the internal cause theory. Is it internal to the person's functioning? The continuing danger theory, is the person likely to be an ongoing danger? And policy concerns, you know, among other things, is it easy to feign mental illness? No, it's not. Uh, and it stems from a common concern for public safety uh, and uh, recurrence. So... You know, that's the first stage. In many ways, the easier stage, as the courts have said, to show that the person has a mental illness. Now you have to also, you know, navigate these other strains here. You have to show that the person is incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of the act or omission as, as one part of the second stage or the other part, as I'm about to explain. You have to show that the effects of mental disorder are more than, involve more than uh, uh, something that's just uh, um, passing in its effects or minimal. Uh, the person has to have uh, to be held criminally responsible more than simple awareness of the act in the sense of the immediate physical qualities. You have to have more than mere knowledge to apprehend the nature and, and of the act and its consequences. So if your mental uh, state is so skewed because of your mental disorder you fall below this standard, then you may be incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of the act or omission. The other limb of uh, the mental disorder uh, defense is if you have the mental disorder, you're either uh, shown to be unable to appreciate the nature and quality of the act or possibly incapable of knowing that the act was wrong. Due to your mental condition, you're incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong. And the courts determine whether the person uh, was incapable because of his or her mental condition uh, f uh, from knowing that the act committed was one that he or she ought not to have done. And we say now it's more than merely legally wrong. 
accused, an accused person with you know, a serious mental illness may know that killing is a crime but may not understand it's morally wrong owing to delusions. So that you know, to succeed on this limb, it has to be shown you're incapable of knowing that the act is morally wrong in the circumstances according to the moral standards in society. Unable to apply moral judgment in the particular transaction that the person is accused uh, of uh, uh, committing. Uh, so, who may introduce the NCR defense? Usually the accused. Um, and whether the accused raises it is a tactical issue for many people. You look at the seriousness of the offense, you look at the strengths of the Crown's case, you look at the willingness of the accused to advance this defense, you look at the relative lengths of state intrusions following a, a successful NCR verdict or a guilty plea. Part of the mental disorder amendments originally, now repealed, were to introduce caps on the length of time to which you could be subject to a disposition under the mental disorder provisions. And it was the outer limit of criminal punishment. But the Parliament of Canada eventually repealed that. Now you can, like Mr. Conway, from, you know, uh, whose case was decided at the Supreme Court of Canada, his index offense in the early 1980s was sexual assault. It was a serious offense, but at the time he would have had a maximum term of imprisonment of five years. Before they repealed the capping provisions, that would have been the length of time to which he could have been subjected to a disposition um, under the mental disorder amendments. At the time of the decision in the Conway case in 2010, he had been subject to a disposition and in a forensic custodial setting for 27 years. You see, so that there is no outer limit now on the length of time that the state can intrude upon your liberty. So that's relevant to your defense. And the Crown can also introduce mental disorder as a defense, but uh, it has more uh, restrictions on when it, it uh, uh, can do so. So this is yet another procedural chart uh, which tells you, you know, what happens following the NCR verdict. I'll go through it quickly for you just so you get a sense of it. The accused is who is found not criminally responsible. So we've navigated through then the NCR defense, the substantive law that I just mentioned, section 16 and the two limbs of section 16. Now the verdict is in, the person is found not criminally responsible. I'm just going to show you what happens after that which will elucidate the review board provisions of the criminal code. Found, following the person being found not criminally responsible, the court may hold a disposition hearing, and it shall on application. Um, if the court doesn't hold one, then the person uh, um, is uh, um, kept according to whatever his terms of release or detention are, and then the review board holds a hearing, and the review board makes a disposition. Courts can also do this, but usually it's review boards, so I'm going to simplify things for you. The review board makes a decision uh, that's based on the factors that I mentioned in section 672.54. That's the list of factors that I said, you know, now incorporates the need to protect the public as the number one factor. The accused can get an absolute discharge or discharge subject to conditions. Absolute discharge, no longer subject to state control, you walk away effectively. Discharge subject to condition, you can live in the community but you're strictly controlled as you would be under bail effectively. Or detention in custody in a hospital, possibly also subject to conditions where the review board delegates uh, the authority to the hospital with specifying out a floor and a ceiling uh, of uh, rights to a liberty are. And then after this, what else do we need to know? Uh, there can be appeals on question of law or mixed questions of law and fact. The reviews by review boards are mandatory within, their, uh, with every t within 12 months of a disposition, every 12 months thereafter. It's extendable in certain instances as the law stands for violent offenses to 24 months. Um, uh, so th those are mandatory reviews. There are also mandatory reviews when the facility requests it or where restrictions have increased for more than seven days, restrictions on the person's liberty. There are also discretionary reviews at the request of the accused um, or at the board's uh, discretion at any time. So the accused can ask for a review of, of his or her uh, uh, status. So that's what happens in terms of the procedural outflow following a verdict of not criminally responsible. In terms of these disposition proceedings, what happens at the Criminal Review Board? There's been quite a bit of litigation, actually an uncharacteristic level of activity at the Supreme Court of Canada uh, since the Swain decision of, uh, of 1991. So there have been quite a few cases which help us understand you know, how we are to construe these provisions that have been introduced by Parliament to control what was formerly the unfettered discretion of the Lieutenant Governor at the pleasure of the Lieutenant Governor. We're well beyond that. So 
Let's look at what some of the cases have uh, said. What's the purpose of these provisions? Because if, if these are the purposes, you ought not to, as the Parliament of Canada, mess about with them. Um, the special NCR verdict is neither an acquittal, you know, as Mayor Ford thought it was, nor is it a conviction. It diverts offenders to a special stream that provides individualized assessment and treatment for those found to be a significant danger. Because if they're not a significant danger, they don't, they're not under criminal review board control anymore. Uh, for persons who are uh, NCR, um, there are two goals here which we have to keep in mind. Protecting the public and treating the mentally ill person fairly and appropriately. We can only confine people, according to the Supreme Court of Canada in the Owen case, for reasons of public protection, not punishment. I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Parliament doesn't seem to be fully aware of that. But that's what the Supreme Court says our mental disorder provisions are about. These preambular factors that I mentioned, you know, that where we look at the other needs of the accused and, and, and so on, um, you know, the, the need to protect the public and all of this, you know, these are singularly important and we conclude them as the law now stands with the least onerous and least restrictive uh, disposition, both for NCR accused and unfit accused. So those preamble factors are very important. And the least onerous and least restrictive principle, you know, is perhaps the most significant, you know, beyond the protection of the public one. Uh, as the Mazai case in, said in 2006, um, this new element added in Part 20.1 is an assurance of procedural fairness and dignity for the NCR accused and a commitment to ensure that his or her liberty interests are to be infringed as minimally as possible. That's how important it was for the Supreme Court of Canada. This was meant to be considered at every stage uh, and it didn't apply just to the choice among dispositions, it applied to conditions as well. Why am I emphasizing this so much? Well, because it's a break on state authority. It says you can't do more than necessary you know, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, affect the accused liberty and you must do as little as possible in the circumstances while still accomplishing the state's uh, purpose. I'm emphasizing this because in these new amendments in Bill C-54, this is gone. Just as it was, as I mentioned before, under Bill C-10, under the Corrections and Conditional Release Act the amendments uh, of that in 2010. You're entitled to receive an absolute discharge free of state control then if you're no longer a significant danger. Um, and uh, you're entitled to uh, a, 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 an absolute discharge unless the review board is able to conclude that you pose a significant risk. Review board proceedings are inquisitorial, they're not adversarial. It's not like a trial, you know, where it's the crown versus the accused, they have a different aura to them. They're meant to, by the, you know, according to the Supreme Court of Canada. When I was a lawyer for our review boards, perhaps because of my adversarial nature, I've, I have oppositional defiant problems. Um, <laughs> I'm getting over them. Um, but, you know, they're not meant to be adversarial, right? They're meant to be inquisitorial, looking at the facts, finding out what the right uh, decision is. Who bears the onus of proof at a review board proceeding? Basically, we get down to this one to make progress to Bill C-54, um, it it's, uh, must be justified by the review board uh, it itself. Uh, it doesn't create a presumption of dangerousness. Um, it doesn't impose a burden in either direction. The review board has to conclude. It must always, the, the authority and the, the responsibility to determine whether a person is a danger or not always remains with the quarter review board. How certain must the review board be? Well, it's not a beyond the reasonable doubt standard. It's not the civil standard as in unfitness matters. It's something different from that. Uh, it must be supported by evidence. Um, and the Supreme Court here also noted that with respect to uh, decisions on dangerousness, that it's extremely difficult even for experts to predict whether a person will offend in the future. And any assessment is not a guarantee. We can't expect absolute certainty in any human conduct domain, but certainly we can't expect it here. Can a review board order treatment? No, but they can, uh, you know, do some things, you know, to, uh, um, even though they can't order treatment, uh, they, they can provide some, as I mentioned before, uh, they, they can't actually prescribe, uh, but they have the power and authority to make uh, conditions that will be binding on some parties, including hospitals. They can't actually order treatment for individual accused, order treatment against individual accused. 
Do these provisions, the mental disorder amendments that were created after the Swain case, do they infringe Section 7 of the Charter? The answer by the Supreme Court is no. Uh, that uh, this process that I've just outlined for you does not violate the principles of fundamental justice under Section 7 of the Charter, nor does it violate the equality guarantees under Section 15.1 because the key in both areas is that there's procedural fairness and for the equality guarantee they say that this is an individualized process that's the antithesis of the logic of the stereotype the evil of which lies in prejudging the accused actual situation on the basis of the group to which he or she is assigned so that's why the provisions um, were sanctified constitutionally by the Supreme Court of Canada because they said they permit individualized assessment. It's not a class-based uh, uh, decision whether you're dangerous or not. That is the problem with, again, the new provisions I'm about to show you uh, because they do step into you know, the stereotyping error. Wait, that must be a mistake. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's actually not a mistake. Um, interestingly, the Prime Minister himself uh, took the foreground in introducing what I'm about to discuss, Bill C-54. You know, he thought, and I don't know him to either A, be a lawyer, or B, particularly interested in the interstices of the criminal law. Um, he thought, you know, that uh, it was, for whatever reason, something that he had to take a leadership role on. That is, the Not Criminally Responsible uh, Reform Act that I'm about to introduce for you. What does that tell you? Draw your own inferences for the time being. I actually have this picture up on my wall. I would just want you to know. And, and uh, uh, so that's probably why it infiltrated my slides. <laughs> but to be serious, this is the actual picture of the Prime Minister on the day that Bill C-54 was introduced because he conducted a news conference. It was to my mind, a very disturbing news conference because I think he used images of victims uh, and their survivors of uh, acts that were you know, very disturbing to kind of um, exemplify his political purposes. That's kind of a, what do they call it, a word cloud which kind of deals with Bill C-54. It's as clear as the government's thinking in some ways. So. This is, in my view, another threat on the horizon to persons with mental illness in Canada. I talked before about you know, uh, other bills that you know, would cause increasing criminalization. This is a new, um, and in some ways, in my view, given what I've shown you about the history of the mental disorder defense and the procedural progress we've made in Canada, this is in some ways more pernicious than some of the other bills where the effects are more indirect as the Canadian Psychological and Psychiatric Association showed us. You know, these are more uh, direct assaults on the integrity of some of the fundamental principles of our criminal justice system that say you don't punish people who are severely mentally ill at the time of the commission of the offense. So, what is the legislation supposed to do under this euphemistically called Not Criminally Responsible Reform Act? Uh, well, I'm going to quote here you know, from the Prime Minister's press statement and from his website. You know, because, as I said, he took the leadership role. He takes responsibility for this. The federal government says the bill is part of their commitment to protecting victims of crime and making the streets and communities of Canada uh, safer for Canadians. We're ensuring that public safety comes first in the decision-making process with respect to accused persons found in NCR and enhance the safety of victims. The government pointed directly to this bill, which is also critical for my analysis, as, as one of over 30 measures in three key areas. Tackling violent crime, you know, that's you know, the image that I showed you before, by holding violent criminals accountable for their crimes, which isn't consistent with what I've been telling you about the doctrines surrounding mental disorder, uh, giving victims of crime a, a stronger voice and increasing the efficiency of the justice system. The proposed legislation says then that, first of all, we're going to re the, uh, repeal uh, the current controlling provision uh, and substitute a new one. We're, re we're removing the current provision, the need to protect the public from dangerous persons. That's already part of our law. It's a present first consideration, as I just showed you. We're substituting a new provision that states the safety of the public is the paramount consideration. Review boards and courts in this country were already very mindful of the need to protect the public. And that was because the legislation 
said that and also because they were dealing with persons who, if they weren't a significant threat, were to be given an absolute discharge anyway. So well, we'll get to that. But, uh, but, so it substitutes this new provision. Critically as, as well, it eliminates this reference, which I said was so important, which I emphasized about the uh, dispositions having to be the least onerous and least restrictive to the accused, substituting a requirement to make a disposition. And this is, these are the words of uh, the bill that is necessary and appropriate in the circumstances. To me, that has a more threatening air to it uh, because it jettisons the notion of the least restrictive and least onerous language. It also creates, you know, according to the PM's announcement, uh, a, a new designation of high-risk offenders. I think that they instructed you know, their Department of Justice counsel in a way that said, let's try to avoid constitutional challenge. The only way we can do that is maybe by creating this new range of offenders. We'll call them high-risk. I think they're too clever by half, and I'll explain why. Um, Basically, this provision would say if you're found NCR for a serious personal injury offense and uh, if the court is satisfied there's a substantial likelihood that you'll use violence or your offense was of such a brutal nature, which has nothing to do with individualized assessment and treatment. Your original offense was of such a brutal nature as to indicate a risk of grave uh, physical or psychological harm, then you can't get an absolute discharge. You can't get a discharge with conditions that permits an absence with, from hospital except in limited circumstances. We can limit the time for rehearing to three years, and review board powers are also diminished in other ways as well because only a superior court has the authority to relieve the accused of the high-risk designation. It's also said to enhance the safety of victims and provide them with greater opportunities for involvement uh, with review board proceedings, of which more later. So what's my assessment of this bill? It's fraught with uh, problems. First of all, and you always have to ask this when you consider supposed law reform, you have to ask, is it necessary? And my conclusion and the conclusion of many other people is that no case has been made out for its necessity that reform is not required according to the Canadian Bar Association March 2013 uh, submission, that the existing law already provides for very extensive controls over risk to public safety and considers victims' interests very sensitively. Expert opinion seems to have no place. Already expert NGO opinion is coming out against Bill C-54. Experts such as the Canadian Alliance for Mental Illness and Mental Health, which is a broad umbrella organization that includes many of Canada's premier NGOs advocating for mental health issues uh, and the rights of people to live in the community, they're against it. The Canadian Forensic Mental Health Network is against it, and the Canadian Bar Association, you know, the National Federation of Lawyers, one of the usual suspects for protecting civil liberties in this country, they they have opposed it. But on the other hand, expert opinion on this legislation and other uh, reform bills is routinely ignored and devalued. It's as if people who actually know something, who have committed their lives to working in the justice system and the mental health care system, that somehow or other their input is kind of esoteric, you know, irrelevant. You know, we'll consult who? We'll throw the experts under the bus because what do they know? Well, they have expertise, but we'll ignore that. So that in Bill C-10, you know, there was uh, you know, a large array of uh, responsible organizations that opposed it. Similarly with Bill C-54, it is predictable that every serious mental health <laughs> Um, and uh, legal professional organization in this country will oppose aspects of Bill C-54. Mm -hmm. But it won't matter. The legislation appears in its motivation that sim being similar to other aspects of the, of the government's politicized criminal justice agenda. Unless you think that I'm picking on both the Prime Minister and Mayor Ford, no, this photo you know, I did extensive research for, you know, both texts and images. This is a photo of the Prime Minister and Rob Ford, who had had a high-level discussion about one of the earlier bills, uh, which dealt with gang violence. You know, Mayor Ford was seen as somebody who, in the context of Bill C-10, was somebody who had something significant to contribute. Um, and so... I'm not saying that you shouldn't consult with mayors and, and, and premiers and ministers of justice. I am saying that, you know, if you decide to disavow the role of true experts 
and then consult others, you ought to be asking yourselves, what kind of input are we getting? So that's part of the input that we're getting with respect to bills like this. And when you think about, and I'm not being unfair here, the chummy relationship that people like Mayor Ford has with the Prime Minister, you know, the, the fishing trips that is celebrated in the national news media together, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, you know, what is the subject of discussion and, and why is it that, you know, people, some people get this kind of superior access and influence and other people whose whole lives are dedicated to, again, criminal justice and mental health don't have a particular role. So, Bill C-54 also continues in terms of my fraught with problems analysis, a broad trend of reducing judicial and now criminal review board discretionary powers. You know, part of the assault on the courts and their ability to uh, provide justice to Canadians accused of criminal offenses is that at the sentencing stage traditionally, Canadian criminal court judges had a high level of discretion as to how to do the right thing in the circumstances. Balancing what the accused ought to receive as a punishment with his or her, and from a retributive perspective, with his or her opportunities for rehabilitation and so on. We, we trusted our judiciary to do that. You know, this government is concerned with it, taking that discretionary power away, and that's why minimum mandatory penalties in bills such as I mentioned, Bill C-10, you know, are so threatening to some of our traditional principles of justice. So now it continues it with review boards as well. They're removing discretionary powers from review boards too and saying, we don't trust you now to deal with this supposed group of high-risk offenders. Legislation, therefore, has a, it also has a punitive uh, purpose or effects, which again contradicts the basic nature of the NCR defense. The NCR defense says that we see accused as being morally blameless and not deserving of punishment. We see them, according to the Winko case and every other authority I mentioned, as needing and, and deserving of individualized and balanced assessment and treatment being required instead. The high-risk offender designation undermines that individualized assessment of risk. Review boards and clinicians were already doing that. They were already thinking about you know, whether a person presents a risk to society before Bill C-54 said, we don't trust you to do that, and we're going to take that out of your hands, and we're going to fetter the power of review boards, and we're going to deny this group of high-risk offenders some of the rights that other accused have. It is, I, be, I regret to say, propelled by sensational, unrepresentative cases such as Lee, Turcotte, and Schoenbrunn. These are awful cases you know, th that you may be familiar with, you know, where you know, uh, there was very uh, horrific violence. But on the other hand, what has happened here is that the survivors or victims have had what I believe to be a disproportionate and at times vengeful influence on legislative policy. Of course, if you ask the survivors of somebody who has been killed what they think about the legislation, their input is going to be skewed in one direction. Compared to what we expect from our lawmaking process, which is solemn, uh, deliberative processes that are balanced um, and that are cautious to bring into play a whole range of considerations, not what might be understandably a vengeful response. As the Canadian Bar Association says, Part 20.1, the mental disorder amendments, they're not an opportunity to exact retribution on people. Again, that's the theme, you don't punish them. Punish people who are not morally responsible. The thing is that had this bill been implemented, none of these tragic cases would have been prevented. The bill is irrelevant you know, to these cases involving Mr. Lee, Mr. Turcotte, his case is under uh, appeal, and Mr. Schoenbrunn. You know, these are the people found not criminally responsible. Had these amendments been in place, it would have had nothing whatsoever to do with preventing the harms that occurred here. Other things may have been able to be done that were preventative in nature. But Bill C-54 will not, therefore, uh, have anything to do with protecting Canadians from the very cases that are manipulatively drawn out to bring in political support for these amendments. They're irrelevant to that. We have to think about how the mental states of these people might possibly, and that's all we can ever say, might possibly have been controlled and these terrible incidents uh, prevented. But we can't prevent anything, everything. And we certainly 
could not see this legislation as being something that would have protected the victims of these people you know, who had a flawed enough mental illness that juries found them not criminally responsible. As well, as I mentioned before, the elimination of the least restrictive and least onerous principle strikes at the heart of the legislation and the cases. Um, and I, saw, I said this has happened before in the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. The manner of introduction of the legislation and its provisions propagates stigma and discrimination, which is the theme that I started out with, which shouldn't be clouding our judgment as to what we should do in lawmaking against persons with mental health problems. The Canadian Bar Association again says that it contributes to the stereotype that the mentally ill are dangerous and should be isolated from the community. That's how it was introduced. That's what spawns these changes. The legislation may well be subject, and I've already predicted how this might come about to charter challenges, given what we've seen about the court's previous judicial uh, assessment of the purposes and character of the mental disorder amendments. And it may also be, interestingly, subject to adverse comment by the United Nations Committee on Persons with Disabilities uh, because of its non-conformity with the, this convention that I mentioned to you before, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, because I think it could be argued that it permits uh, detention purely on the basis of disability and not on the basis of risk assessment. It ignores other positive measures that could be used uh, to uh, reduce the likelihood of crises in the community. Um, and uh, it could ensure that people who are brought under the justice umbrella are treated more humanely. It ignores the kinds of anti-criminalization measures or more sensitization measures that I talked about before at the very beginning, a long time ago when I addressed criminalization. So it will not achieve Bill C-54, its intended results. It will further erode the likelihood of some people using the defense because if I'm the person's lawyer, I'm going to say, look, this is what might happen in these circumstances. Maybe we should take another stance here on whether we should defend on the basis of the NCR defense, even if we might have it. It does not offer heightened assurances to the communities or victims. It may, in fact, reduce the protections that are available uh, to victims and the community and to accuse persons in terms of their rights and dignity that are now offered through the mental disorder amendments and uh, the review board procedures. All of its proclaimed objectives are being achieved, therefore, in my view, under the existing legislation, or they could be more efficiently produced, pursued using other methods. As the CBA says, the goal that we have to be thinking of is reintegration, not retribution. Right? Community inclusion eventually when risk is removed, not punishment for people when they're not responsible criminally and when they're not answerable morally. So my conclusion here, I was told that I had an hour and a half. Uh, well, that may well be, unless people want to stay, I've got the whole evening. My conclusion, <laughs> Elizabeth can't throw me out. What am I going to do? What is she going to do to me? Um, my conclusion is here, there are challenges uh, that uh, uh, are available, uh, uh, that, that can be addressed to prevent people from becoming criminalized. It's possible to reduce the number of persons with mental health problems in the criminal justice system. And those people who are su subject to the justice system can be treated more fairly and more humanely. Uh, the mental disorder defense, as I mentioned, is really only appropriately invoked for a few people. If you use it for too many people, then too many people will be subjected too long to its already tenacious provisions. The mental disorder provisions, as they are currently constructed, provide a good balance between public safety and encouraging community reintegration. And I believe there's a responsibility to ensure that the stereotypes of the past do not continue to influence public discourse. That's why I chose to give this talk tonight. That's why I'm glad you stayed for the last hour and a half. And that's why I'm also glad uh, that we have the opportunity for questions now. <laughs> You'd have to drag me off the stage with a hook if I, uh, uh, to uh, uh, say that uh, you know, questions are over. So we've used up a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to hear your comments. So please go ahead. Yes. Oh, boy, that's a very complicated question. And with 50 states with uh, different provisions in terms of the availability of uh, defenses uh, and uh, the standards that obtain procedurally, I couldn't answer um, in any way definitively. What I would say is that 
you know, if anything, in the U.S., there is even more of a retributive and punitive spirit with respect to all aspects of criminal justice, including persons with mental illness. So I don't think very often we can look south of the border for inspiration. If anything, criminal justice policy in the U.S. is reorienting itself that you know, states like Texas and California are gradually recognizing we put too many people in jail for too long a period of time and it's wrong for them and it's wrong for the community. So if anything, at the same time in Canada that we're becoming more punitive, some states in the U.S. have sort of turned that circle and they're recognizing that their criminal justice system had gone awry. Was there another question? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm saddened, uh, as everybody was, by Mr. Tavel's death. Um, and uh, I'm glad that there's been some serious consideration you know, of improvements that might be made in the forensic justice system to try to prevent things like that from happening. On the other hand, I cannot be at all certain, because I don't know the enough about the actual facts of the case. I can't be certain as to whether um, the accused has an available, not criminally responsible defense, um, and uh, I don't know how the trial will unfold. You know, so I, I think um, it's early you know, to say very much about what will happen with the person who's now accused of uh, murder in respect of Mr. Tavel's uh, death. Uh, but I do hope uh, that although this is an anniversary, um, that we just wait the judgment of the criminal court with respect you know, to you know, whether uh, you know, he has a, an available defense of any kind, including the NCR uh, uh, defense. So it's a time of sadness for the community, no doubt. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, as I mentioned in the case of you know, Lee uh, and uh, Turcott and Schoenbrunn, we have to be very careful about cases which are in many ways totally unrepresentative of the way in which persons with mental illness uh, behave in the community and people who are subject to the forensic justice system interact in the community. We have to be very careful that we don't let that, as we have seen in other cases, skew you know, or, or, or divert the criminal justice system you know, from the principles that I tried to outline for you. So I'm, I'm uh, concerned as I would be in any other case uh, that the wrong lessons would be drawn from cases like this one and that we veer too much in another, I believe, wrong direction just as we are now with Bill C-54. Any other questions? Yes. Why are we seeing an increase of people with mental illness in, the, like, in prisons? Is it because people are becoming more educated about mental illness? Or? Well, there's a complex range of factors, you know, uh, some of which I, I've mentioned for you. You know, I think that uh, um, you know, many people who need more supports in the community uh, don't get it, and so therefore they're, they're more likely to come into conflict with the criminal law. Um, and uh, you know, many people uh, whose mental illness ought to be considered more sensitively in the sentencing system uh, don't get the benefit of a judiciary being able to bring mental illness through the criminal code into the sentencing domain uh, as readily as they should be. Um, and then when many people go into the conventional non-forensic, uh, you know, conventional jail or, or penitentiary system, their symptoms get worse. So it's a whole range of things which conspire to produce this phenomenon, but the evidence seems to be clear from every responsible commentator that, you know, the phenomenon of overrepresentation is increasing and it's particularly acute in the jails and penitentiaries of the country. Any other questions? Yes. What is the status of Bill C-54? Is it oh, when I last looked, it would have been given first reading, um, and uh, I think it's not yet got to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Justice Committee uh, stage where they'll hear uh, briefs from organizations. I think I'm right there. I think it hasn't gotten along that far. I think there are some lawyers in the audience who may be more familiar with Bill C-54, but it has not gone very far, as I recall, along the uh, parliamentary route yet. 
But it's at that time when you'll hear, you know, when it's before the, the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights, it's then when you'll hear groups such as we heard for Bill C-10 who will come forward and say some of the same things they've already said, like the Canadian Alliance, the Canadian Forensic Mental Health Group, the Canadian Bar Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, et cetera. I think they'll come before Parliament and say, please, please, restrain yourselves, reconsider this, think about what you're doing that violates fundamental principles. I'd be surprised if they didn't. I don't know whether the government is capable of hearing that. That's the, that's the difficult thing for me as a lawyer and, and as somebody who's very interested in these issues from a disability rights perspective. I'm not sure, given the kind of introduction the bill has had, whether they're actually capable of hearing that. I deeply regret that, but I'm not sure. Yes? Given your use of the term mental illness, yes. um, and, you, and you also say um, an important thing to do is improve supports and services yes. in the community. So what supports and services would you like to see uh, in the community to help with mental illness? Well, I trust you, Steve, to ask an easy question at the end of the evening. <laughs> You know as well as I that what people need is a, a broad range of supports and services that may include you know, enhanced access to mental health treatment of a conventional nature, um, but not just biological, you know, psychosocial support uh, uh, services. But they also need, as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities talks about, they, they, they need the, they have the right recognized to a decent standard of living, you know, to a housing you know, that will uh, accommodate them, to employment opportunities, to educational opportunities, and to participate in other aspects of civic life. They need you know, supports uh, that will guarantee what you and I and everybody in this room you know, has. You know, so a, a whole range of supports. That's a whole other you know, mini-law talk, I think. I don't know that it's absolutely necessary, but I'd prefer it. I'd prefer that legislation provides for positive guarantees of the nature that uh, uh, has been endorsed in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I prefer law to lead social policy, recognizing that it may not always do so. Yes? Um, That was the Bouchard-Lebrun case. You can look at the decision. It's available on the Supreme Court of Canada website. Mr. Bouchard-Lebrun uh, was a person who took PCP as the principal intoxicant. He had also smoked marijuana, and, and I think he had drunk some as well. It was the PCP that particularly accelerated either his intoxication or his psychosis or both. But as I mentioned, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada said he was merely an intoxicated offender because you know, after the PCP wore off, he was normal again. The criticism I mounted of that was that sometimes with persons you know, who have what appears to be toxic psychosis, uh, that sometimes that uh, conceals a longer-term mental health difficulty, uh, a, a pre-existing vulnerability that just sort of tips things. You know, so in that sense, you know, I, I think the case deserves special scrutiny. I argued for it uh, uh, being considered from the perspective of revising uh, the current parliamentary law that we have. Many people have talked about a dangerous intoxication um, uh, defense uh, that ought to be available, rather than, as we presently do, just denying people a defense uh, absolutely. So a dangerous intoxication, I should say, offense. What it would create is a strain of liability which says, you know, if you're, uh, the harm you cause is done while intoxicated, even though you may not match the standards of the criminal law, nor the standards of uh, Section 16, the insanity or, or mental disorder defense, that you may still be able to be punished for the harm you did while in this dangerously intoxicated state. So. It's a complex and interesting case you know, which pushes the limits in both directions with respect to intoxication and mental disorder. It's, it's worth looking at. You know, Bouchard Lebrun. Would that be an aggravating or a mitigating factor, the dangerous offense? The, uh, well, that's an, it's a different law reform discussion that we, that we could have. I mean, certainly some people would characterize that as absolute liability, you know, just because you did the harm, regardless of your altered state of mind due to intoxication. So there are competing policy arguments. 
Um, but right now, the choices are too stark in many ways, and they don't accommodate the, the dangerous things that people do when they are very severely intoxicated and harm others. Anybody else? Yes? On uh, the issue of criminalization, no, I don't, I'm not aware of any. Okay, so I feel like it's too terrible. That's the Department of Justice that said that, yeah. Okay, um, I'm wondering, you said that the three cases that you talked about were not typical uses of this offense. I'm wondering no, I said that they're not typical cases in terms of the relationship of people with severe mental disorders and uh, uh, the way they behave in the community. They are unrepresentative cases in terms of the level of violence uh, at, that was done in those circumstances. And I said that that was the mistake, to let that drive the law. And um, I was wondering, um, because there's no, okay, is, do you have any idea how long a lot of the dispositions allow for restrictions on people's rights? Well, the criminal code imposes no order limits, right? There are no caps now as there used to, or as was proposed in, you know, in the early version of uh, Part 20.1. Um, so that uh, you know, there's, there's no order limit effectively. I mean, on the other hand, you know, it's not in anybody's interest you know, and it certainly, in my view, is not in, for example, Mr. Conway's interest, as I mentioned, the case that I, I talked about from the Supreme Court of Canada. It's not in anybody's interest to be in an institution for a long period of time, right? People need to be gradually moved into the community because that's where they belong, assuming that, that any subsisting risk has been minimized or eliminated. Um, you know, so there are no outer limits unfortunately, in my view. Uh, and uh, um, you know, in terms of average length of disposition, it will vary from province to province and offense uh, to offense. And in my view, and, uh, you know, many people are detained longer than they should be. In part, that's because of some of the factors that I mentioned about you know, there being unwarranted assumptions of dangerousness. Also, I think it's because there are often unreceptive communities. There aren't you know, appropriate housing and other options for people to be moved into the community so that even when clinicians and review boards might think that a person should be moved into the community, there's no place for them. You know, so that, that accounts for what, for what I believe is often overlong stays in forensic psychiatric facilities. Anybody else? Yes? Hi. Um, you mentioned something about transitory states uh, when a person is, like, say, in class to yes. commit a crime. Would that also include uh, people who have amnesia or commit a crime while they're sleepwalking? Uh, it certainly includes people who are truly sleepwalking, assuming that's not grounded in a mental disorder. There again, you could look at the Parks case, a fascinating case on sleepwalking, a homicide case from the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, but a person who is a, a real sleepwalker and, and, and where the sleepwalking is not caused by an underlying mental health problem, that person would get a, a full acquittal. It's extremely rare for sleepwalkers to hurt people, uh, but that's what happened in, in the Parks case because they don't have an ongoing mental health difficulty. They have a sleep disturbance which made them into an automaton effectively whenever they did what they did. But that's a very rare case. Any transitory state that's not uh, down to you know, a mental health difficulty can result in an absolute acquittal. Now having said that, um, you know, what I said uh, is that um, it is a part of the policy guidance for the interpretation of Section 16.1 defenses uh, that uh, the courts look at long-term or recurrent danger not all mental health difficulties are of that character. It is possible to have, as I understand it, you know, a, a temporary mental health problem that goes away without a prior history, so a, a, a temporary psychosis. But that person, if it's a true but temporary psychosis, could still defend on the basis of Section 16, not on the involuntariness defense, as I mentioned, for sleepwalkers or concussed people. The case. Yes. One of his in-laws and, uh, and uh, uh, was also charged with uh, and acquitted of attempted murder of the other in-law, yes. He was the person who, you know, s sleepwalked his way across Toronto and then, you know, yeah. and then 
it did these terrible things. But the Supreme Court of Canada said they only had evidence of a sleep disorder, not of a, a subsisting or ongoing mental health problem. That's why Mr. Parks was acquitted. We're done, it looks like. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I appreciate your questions.